Hello, I'm Derek Walker, the pastor of the Oxford Bible Church, and thank you for joining me on this God Day. And today I want us to think about the wonderful parable of Jesus called the Good Samaritan. It's in Luke chapter 10. And I just want to start by reading the, the context of this and, and then really share how the gospel of salvation is in this parable. It says in Luke 10, 25, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? We'll see that this is the key question that the parable answers. He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You've answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, and that's his problem, he's trying to justify himself, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And then Jesus answered by telling the famous parable of the Good Samaritan. And, uh, you know, you, you no doubt know the parable, but we'll go through it uh, and perhaps see some new insights from it. But this parable works on three levels. Uh, and, of course, the level that is usually used, uh, which is very important, is that Jesus answered his question, what does, who is my neighbor? What does it mean to love your neighbor? Uh, that it's, it certainly means that it's pr giving practical help to this person who needs it. And it's also talking about the fact that our neighbor is not just our best buddies, it's anyone we might meet in the journey of life, uh, even if it's a Samaritan, even if it's someone who we, we have no normal connections with in life, isn't our kind of person. Uh, and of course, in those days, the, the Jews and the Samaritans often hated each other. And, and yet Jesus is saying, if you meet this person in need, they are your neighbor. And Jesus was teaching them what it, what it means to love your neighbor, because the Jews sometimes interpreted it as meaning just loving my fellow Jew. But Jesus is saying, no, it's loving all human beings. Uh, and secondly, this parable, Jesus was bursting his bubble. You see, this was a self-righteous person. He was trying to justify himself. That's the biggest mistake you can make in your life, is try and justify yourself before God. Because we're all sinners, we, we could not possibly do that. And so Jesus has to burst his bubble. He has to show him that God's standard is so high that he fails. And that the, his only hope is to receive and trust in the salvation that God provides, rather than trying to save yourself. And so what he does, he bursts his self-righteous bubble by showing what God's standard really is, what it means to love his neighbor. is not just loving his fellow Jew, but even to love that one that you've been brought up to hate, that one that you've been brought up to di dislike. It means more than loving your friends. And showing that is the God kind of love, that God loves everyone. And that's the kind of love we need to have. That burst his bubble. Once he told that story, and he, his, the prejudice in his heart were, was revealed, and he, he had to admit that that good Samaritan was the true neighbor. Um, and that as a Jew, he is now called by God to love the despised Samaritan, then that convicted him of his sin, that he did not keep the law, and he did not love his neighbor as he ought to. But the parable, and what I really want to focus on, is that the, that the original question by this man, Jesus answered that as well, which was, how can I have eternal life? And therefore, we should expect to see the gospel in this parable. And there's a beautiful picture of the gospel in the Good Samaritan. And so that's really what I want to show by, by really reading this parable allegorically, just like the parable of the sower was interpreted point by point in an allegorical way. Um, I believe that we can see the hidden code uh, of the gospel inside this parable. So who is the Good Samaritan, and I put it to you that in this parable, Jesus is the Good Samaritan. He is the one that is despised by men. The Jews despise the Good Samaritan, and, and, and sadly, so often, uh, not just, the, not just the, some of the Jewish leaders of Jesus' time, but throughout history, 
Oh, Jesus is the perfect one, the loving one. He's been despised. He's been rejected of men. And, but he is the one who came to save us. And, and he is the good Samaritan in this story. And um, let's read, read this uh, parable and, and let's see the gospel in it. It says, uh, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And um, this is a picture of all mankind, all of us in Adam. Jerusalem is, is God's city. And, and we were created to be with God. Uh, and uh, ultimately, we will live with God in the heavenly Jerusalem. And then he went down. This is the fall of man. He went down to Jericho. Jericho by the Dead Sea is the lowest place on the earth. So man went from the heights of Jerusalem down to the lowest place on the earth. And this was a dangerous 20-mile journey, a two-day journey in a barren wilderness. It was called the Red and Bloody Way. This man was very foolish traveling on his own. He never should have gone on his own. They always traveled in groups because there were robbers, thieves anywhere, all kinds of craggy corners that if you went round, you'd be out of sight and you are easy prey and uh, many cliffs. And so it was very dangerous. It was crooked and downhill all the way from 2,300 feet above sea level down to about 1,300 feet below sea level. And uh, he got robbed. And this is a picture. We were meant to dwell with God in Jerusalem, in the city of peace, the city of the great king where God rules, where his presence is. But we foolishly sinned and we went our own way. And we went down uh, into a dangerous wilderness. And um, that's the history of mankind, full of blood and death. It was called the red and bloody way. All we like sheep have gone astray, the Bible says. We have turned every one to his own way. And we were heading also for certain eternal death. And um, this place called Jericho is, is a place where, of, of uh, judgment. And it says that he fell among thieves um, and who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him and departed him. And he, he says, these thieves took his clothes off him. They were, uh, he, was, he was now naked, full of shame. This is a picture of us falling into sin. We lost our robe of righteousness before God. We are now naked and ashamed, sinners uh, before God. And then it says, they wounded him, which is a picture of sickness, that we were now, we are now wounded emotionally and physically as a result of our sin. And he says they departed. And so now here is this man, he's left all alone. And it says they left him half dead, uh, leaving him half dead. And you know, when God warned uh, Adam in the garden, he said in Genesis 2:17, in the day that you sin, you will surely die. Literally it is dying, you will die. You will suffer two deaths. First of all, Adam immediately died spiritually. He was cut off from the life of God. Uh, but then that led to his physical death later on. And in the same way, that's how where we were. We were half dead because we were dead spiritually. Our spirit was dead to God. And it was only a matter of time before we would die physically and enter a state of eternal death of eternal separation from God. That is a picture of us all without Christ. But uh, the, the, it, it, the story gets even worse as we follow it on. Now it says, Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he arrived at that place, came and looked and passed by where he was on the other side. And so this is a picture and, and as, the, as, as this Jewish scribe would have heard the story, thought he would have said, yes, surely the, how this is how this story is going to work out, that, that surely the priest and surely the Levite, this is our best men. These are our holiest men. Surely they will help this poor traveler. But they don't. They pass by on the other side. They don't want to make themselves unclean. They don't want to, they don't want to uh, get, get their hands dirty. And this is a picture 
of religion, that religion by itself cannot save us. Um, ritual cannot save us. Um, these figures represented religion, and particularly the outward form of religion, and that they, they cannot save us. Um, mankind has come up with all kinds of religions, to, but, but they're all means by which uh, systems whereby man does certain things to get God's favor, and they all fail. You cannot satisfy God's righteousness that way. And so the works of the law can't save us. They just pronounce us dead. They just walk by and say, well, he's a hopeless case. He's lost. The law pronounces us guilty and dead, but it can't save us. It doesn't have the power to save us. Rituals by themselves cannot save us. Only Jesus can save us. Only Jesus can heal us. We have to turn to the living God, Jesus Christ, to save us. And so uh, we were, they pronounce us unclean, but they can't save us. But praise God. Now the story has a twist because he says, now a certain Samaritan. Now this would have really stung to the original Jewish hearer because uh, this Samaritan, as soon as that word was conjured up, it was like, that's the, that's the enemy. That's the, the Samaritans were like half Jews. They, they were the product of intermarriage between the Jews that were left in the land and Gentiles that were brought into the land after the Assyrian conquest. The Assyrians deliberately mixed up the populations. And so the Samaritans were considered in the Jewish eyes in the south as be, being the half, half breeds. And they despised them. And, uh, and so, or at least they were just as bad as Gentiles, you might say. And so this is the last person this person would have expected to help the, this Jew. And so this is where Jesus twists the story and, and, and is really making the point that we must love everyone, even the Samaritan. Now, the certain Samaritan, and this, of course, is a picture of Jesus. As he journeyed, he came to where he was. I love that. Jesus came to where we, we were. Jesus, even though we were enemies of God, and the Samaritan was the enemy of the Jew. Uh, and the Bible says we were enemies as sinners. We were enemies to God. And yet this Samaritan still loved this one that hated him, that despised him, that thought nothing of him. He loved him and he came to where he was. Praise God. And thank God for Jesus. Even when we were sinners, we, were, we, we had no, uh, nothing in us that would commend us to God. And yet he still came to where we were. He sought us out because he loved us and he wanted to save us. And so it says, uh, as he journeyed, he came to where he was. And I believe he was, he was searching. He was looking to, to, and Jesus came, it says, to seek and to save the lost. Jesus came purposefully to us. He came to seek us out and to save us. And it says he came to where he was. And that's a wonderful picture too, because we could never get, get to heaven. We could never come to God. We could never save ourselves. We just didn't have what it took. This man couldn't do anything to save himself. He was just left there, half dead. And, and the good Samaritan came to him. And thank God, God came to us in the person of Jesus Christ to save us. And to, like the good shepherd went to go after that lost sheep and carried him back, rejoicing on his shoulders. So the good Samaritan came to save us. And it says, when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Not like the others, because he was unclean, disgusting. Um, they, they, they walked by on the other side. He had compassion on him. When Jesus saw us in our sin, he had compassion on us. He saw that we were lost, that we were hopeless. We were headed for a lost eternity, but he had compassion on us. Jesus was often moved with compassion and, and healed the sick. And compassion is deep love welling up from within, causing you, motivating you to take action, to meet their need. And that's what Jesus did. He risked his life and he got down in the ditch. Uh, to save this man. And the compassion of Jesus caused him to die for us. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, 
God showed his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It says that he went to him and he bound up his wounds. I love that. You see, he healed. Jesus healed our wounds. He, he died for us on the cross. And it says that by his stripes, we were healed. He took our wounds. He took our sin and our wounds on himself. And he died for us. Uh, and he healed our wounds. And that's what the good Samaritan did. And it explains that he did this by pouring in the bandages, wounds, pouring in the oil and the wine. And this is, speaks of the two key ministries of the Holy Spirit. First of all, the oil represents the Holy Spirit in the new birth. He poured in the oil. And the oil of the Holy Spirit, he rubbed that oil in, into our spirit, praise God, and made our spirits alive again to God. And then it says, he poured in the wine. Hallelujah. And, and you know, the Bible says that you can't, you, 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 you can't, uh, the wine of the Holy Spirit is the, is the Holy Spirit himself filling us from within. But when you were born again, also the Holy Spirit came to live within you. Um, they, these are the twofold blessing of the Holy Spirit. First, we're born again, and then the Holy Spirit comes and lives within us. You know, Jesus told a parable, he says um, in Matthew 9:17. Don't, men do not put new wine into old wineskins, lest the old wineskins break uh, and the wine runs out and the wineskins perish, but they put new wine into, re, into new wineskins or renewed wineskins. And, and what he's talking about here is the, our old spirit is like an old wineskin. It can't handle the Holy Spirit. So what God did first is he rubbed, he renewed our wineskin by rubbing oil in it. And that's the Holy Spirit recreating our human spirit. And now we have a new wineskin that can take and, and receive the Holy Spirit within. And the new wine of the Holy Spirit came into you when you were born again. And that's the Holy Spirit himself living into you. So this is a picture of the gospel that Jesus comes to us and he renews us, he restores us, he heals our wounds, he gives us himself in the Holy Spirit. Praise God. And then it says... He set him on his own beast. In other words, he lifted us up, but maybe on his donkey. And uh, in the same way, Jesus lifted us out of the kingdom of darkness and lifted us to sit in heavenly places in Christ. Um, praise God. And um, he was, this is all by pure grace. And, and I want you to notice that this man, this is a picture of the gospel because this man could do nothing to save himself. The good Samaritan came to him. He did it all. The only thing was, is he could have rejected the good Samaritan. He could have said to him, you know, forget it. You're a horrible Samaritan. Leave me alone. Don't touch me. He could have rejected that uh, salvation. And, you know, Praise God, he didn't. But uh, in the same way, Jesus comes to each and every person and he's willing to heal and he's willing to pour in the oil and the wine and to save them. But they have to accept the ministry of the Good Samaritan. This is the gospel, you see, that Jesus is preaching. He's saying you can't save yourself. You can't justify yourself. You're as hopeless as that, as that man. But the only thing he could do is say yes to the Good Samaritan and receive by faith the ministry of the Good Samaritan and let the Good Samaritan save you. And so it is. You can't save yourself, but Jesus, he's the Good Samaritan. He comes to you and he offers you his forgiveness and his eternal life and, and the new birth. And, and you have to say yes. I receive your ministry. I can't save myself, but you still are responsible to say yes, to receive Jesus. Because if you say, no, leave me alone. I want to do it myself. I want to stand on my own merits. Then the Good Samaritan will have to leave you, die in your sins and go, go to hell. After that, we, the story continues. It's not over yet. It says that he brought him to an inn. So... This, I believe, is the church. When we become believers, we're not just left on our own. We are to be part of the bigger church, the body of Christ. 
and um, it's to, a place of protection, a place of peace, the place where he could recover and get strong again and, uh, and join together with the fellow travelers. And uh, he, the good Samaritan took him to the inn and then he, uh, it says, on the morrow, on the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii and gave him to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. Whatever you spend over that, I will repay when I come again. Now, this is very interesting because this kind of detail is hard to explain. If the parable is just about, you know, being a good neighbor, um, why would Jesus add in all this extra detail? Because he's developing a whole picture of salvation. We come to the inn and Jesus put us into the hands of the innkeeper who is the Holy Spirit. And he gives him two denarii, which is actually two days wages. And he basically says, I'm going to be away for two days. So I'm going to give you two days wages. That's everything you need is paid for. And he basically said, whatever he needs, whatever bread, whatever food, whatever drink, whatever provision he needs while I'm away, it's paid for. And therefore, you give it to him upon request because I've, I've, I've covered it. And in the same way, on the cross, Jesus paid in full for all the blessings in life, for all the supply of the Holy Spirit that you need in this life, for all the healing that you need in this life, for all the victory over sin that you need in your life, all the provision that you need in this life, it's paid for by Jesus. And he's put you in the hands of the Holy Spirit and, and, and put you within the church. And he's made that full provision for you. All you have to do is ask for more grace, ask for more of his spirit, and he will fill you up. He'll give you more of his wine and all of the blessings. And so it's interesting to me that he says, I'm going away. And that's a picture, of course, that Jesus, having come to save us, he then went away. He would have gone back. The good Samaritan went back to Jerusalem and he would had some business to do in Jerusalem. And then he would have returned to the inn. And then he says, I will come back again and then I'll, I'll settle any accounts. And in the same way, when G, after Jesus came to save us, what did he do? He ascended on high to the heavenly Jerusalem, praise God, and then he promises that he will return, just as in the parable. And there's a hint here as to how long he'll be away, because it specifically says two denarii, two days wages. So the clear implication is that he's going to be away for two days. Now in the Bible, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. So maybe this is a hint that Jesus is going, he's going to be away for about 2,000 years and then he's going to return for us. And so you probably realize that we are very close to being 2,000 years away from when he died and rose again for us. And so maybe there's a hint in this parable that actually Jesus is coming back soon for us. But in the meantime, he's given us the Holy Spirit. He's left us in the hands of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. And he has paid the price in full for us to be blessed. And so I love the fact that God gives us the Holy Spirit freely um, in the oil and the wine. I just wanted to share about the oil and the wine, but I just wanted you to see the gospel is, is in, the, in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus is our good Samaritan. He found us on the road, the, 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 half dead, wounded and dying on the road to Jericho. And he didn't leave us there. He saved us. He healed us. He lifted us up. And he poured in the oil and the wine. And he restored our soul. Praise God. And now he says, I'll be back. I'll be back. And... I am going to bring you back with me to the heavenly Jerusalem, praise God. And all of us together in that inn are those who have been saved, who've had the sense, if you like, to accept the salvation that he freely gives us. We've allowed him to pour in the oil and the wine. And as I say, the oil, uh, we see oil and wine together often in the Bible. 
Um, Psalm 23, 5, he says, you anoint my head with oil, my cup, that's my cup of wine, runs over. And so God's anointed us with oil. That's, that's when we're born again. We're regenerated by the Holy Spirit. And then he put his wine, his spirit, inside our spirit so that our cup runs over now as rivers of living water. God's blessings in Psalm 104, 15 are wine that makes glad the heart of man and oil to make his face shine. Praise God. And then it says in the Joel prophesies that the vats of heaven will overflow with wine and oil and it will come to pass afterward that I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Praise God. If you, if you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, do so now. Re see yourself as you really are. You cannot save yourself. All your religion can't save yourself. All your works can't save yourself. You're like that wounded man on the road to Jericho. You, can't, you, you are half dead. And you, the good Samaritan, Jesus, comes to you. And he reaches out to you. And he says, if you let me. I will save you. I'll pour in the oil. You'll be born again. I'll pour in my wine into you and you'll have the Holy Spirit living in you and flowing out of you, running over, praise God. And I will restore you and I'll pay for your full provision for you. And I will come again for you and I'll take you with me back to the heavenly Jerusalem. And so the Bible says that, again, the wine of the Spirit is ours. Now, if we're born again, he says, do not be drunk with wine, Ephesians 5.18, but be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. So you have the Holy Spirit within your spirit if you're born again. And he says, don't be drunk with wine, but rather drink of the Spirit of God who is within you. He wants to fill you. Be filled with the Spirit. And, and that is a command to, to be filled. And that command implies that the Holy Spirit is constantly available to you. He, he is there in your spirit, and he's ready to fill your soul, to fill your heart, mind, emotions. Uh, he says, be filled. So in other words, you just have to let the Spirit fill you. You just have to surrender your soul to him, and he will fill you. And that's an ongoing command. Be being filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's only possible because the wine of the Spirit is, he's, is already in you because your wineskin has been renewed by the oil of God. And now you can contain the wine of the Holy Spirit without breaking, without cracking. And now he will fill you to overflowing. He'll fill you as much as you allow him to fill you.